Hello everyone. So now we'll discuss uh, our discussion on thalassemia. So this is the second hemoglobinopathy we are discussing after the sickle cell disease. Now in the sickle cell disease, we have discussed that the amount of hemoglobin that is produced it will be normal. But the hemoglobin is a different type of hemoglobin which has different properties. And that is, that is ultimately causing the sickle cell disease. So that is there is basically a qualitative defect. So in sickle cell disease, there is a qualitative effect, defect. But in thalassemia, it is actually a quantitative defect. That means the amount of hemoglobin that is produced is less. Okay, amount of hemoglobin is less. So that is because of decreased production of the globin gene. So heme production is normal. The globin gene production is abnormal. Okay. So this globin gene production uh, is reduced and it can be either the alpha globin gene, uh, I mean the alpha globin can be reduced or the beta globin can be reduced. If there is decreased production of alpha globin, that is known as alpha thalassemia. If there is decreased, decreased production of beta globin, that is known as the beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia is much more common than the alpha thalassemia. So we first discuss about the beta thalassemia. Now, thalassa means C in Greek, and it is common in uh, Mediterranean basin. Again, uh, so these conditions are common where there is, where there is uh, malaria endemicity. So let's start with beta, beta thalassemia. Before going into the pathogenesis, let's first understand what are the types of mutations that we are going to see. In alpha thalassemia, we'll discuss later that uh, most, mostly the deletion mutations are common. In beta thalassemia, point mutations are usually common. Now, if you see, there are three types of point mutations that we are going to see. Either it can involve the, the process of splicing, or there can be mutation involving the promoter region, or there can be some chain terminator mutation. Okay. So uh, first we'll see the splicing mutation. So splicing we have discussed in the basics of hemoglobin that uh, in this process, uh, this is actually post transcriptional modification. In this process, the introns are removed and the exomes are joined together. There are also two more uh, post transcriptional modification we have discussed previously. That is five prime capping at the poly A tail. And we have discussed that this process of splicing happens because of the spliceosomes. Now this splicing mutation can be of two types. Either the splicing mutation can affect an area, I mean, can, can affect a region in the intron, but it can affect a region at a site that is a junction between intron and exon. Now, let us see what happens when the mutation is here. That means at the junction of intron and exon. If the mutation is affecting the site of intron exon junction, the spliceosome cannot detect this area. The spliceosome cannot detect this area. So, that means this this part of intron cannot be removed. That means there will be the splicing cannot happen normally. So this mutation will cause, this mutation will actually cause no production of beta globin. So absolutely there will be no beta globin production because the splicing cannot happen normally. If there is normal, if normal splicing cannot happen, there will be the mRNA cannot be produced normally and there will be no beta globin production. Okay. So, and this, if there is no beta globin production, this condition is denoted as this beta zero, beta zero. Now we'll see the second scenario. If the, if the mutation is affecting an area which is inside the intron, which is in the intron, what happens whenever the splicing or the process of splicing starts? Sometimes the splicing can happen normally. Sometimes the splicing can happen normally and it can remove the entire portion of the intron. And during that process, they can produce some of the normal beta globins, some of the normal beta globins. But sometimes this mutated site will act as a cryptic splice site. I mean, the mutated site inside the intron will act as a site from where the splicing can happen. That means now the splice, the spliceosome can also detect this area, this mutated area as a junction of intron and exon, and they will cause splicing of this portion only. Okay, so this is also possible. So both normal splicing pulse possible and abnormal splicing possible whenever there is a mutation in the intron. If there is a mutation in the junction, there will be no splicing, I mean, no normal splicing, no beta globin production that is known as beta zero. If there is a mutation inside the intron, sometimes there will be normal splicing and some amount of beta globin production. And sometimes there will be abnormal splicing, no beta globin production. So in this, in this scenario, when the mutation is inside the intron, they will cause this condition that is denoted as beta zero, that, sorry, beta plus, beta plus means some amount of beta globin production is possible. But if the mutation is present in the junction, no beta globin production. So that is not denoted as beta zero. That means no beta globin is produced. Okay. So I hope this concept is clear. And uh, 
You need to remember that this slicing mutations, these are most common cause of most common cause of beta plus variant. Most common cause of this beta plus variant. Okay. Now coming to the promoter mutation. So before that, again, thalassemia is also an autosomal recessive condition. Similar to uh, sickle cell disease, all the hemoglobin pathways are autosomal recessive in nature. Okay. Now coming to promoter mutation. Promoter mutation means the area in the mRNA from where the translation process will start. Now, usually what happens in this promoter mutation, some amount of trans some amount of translation is possible. Okay, some amount of translation is possible. So in this condition, there will be reduction in beta globin production. So this will also cause beta plus. This will also produce beta plus type of uh, phenomenon. What happens in chain termination mutation, chain terminator mutations? That means there is there is abnormal termination of the in the process of translation, abnormal termination. So before the before the uh, actual termination, there will be premature termination of the process of transla translation. That, so that means it will not produce any beta globin. It will not produce any beta, beta globin. So they will produce this beta zero type of phenotype, and uh, and this is the most common cause of most common cause for beta zero. Okay, so I hope it is clear. And you now you understood what is beta zero and what is beta plus. Beta plus means some amount of beta globin production is possible. Beta zero means no no beta globin production. And most common cause for beta plus is slicing. Most common cause for chain uh, I mean beta zero is chain terminator mutation. Okay, now that you have, we have understood this, now we'll see what is what is going to happen whenever you have this beta thalassemia. Okay, well, what 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 is going to happen? So basically, if you do not have beta globins, if you do not have beta globins. This alpha globin chains will tend to accumulate. They will tend to, there will be excessive, I mean, inappropriately excessive alpha globin chain deposition. And, and this alpha globin chains, they will cause, they, they will tend to precipitate on the surface of the, on the membrane of the RBCs, uh, developing RBCs inside the uh, bone marrow. I would, I would uh, do it like this. So they will have nucleus because they are inside the bone marrow and they are precursors. So I've just forgotten to make the nucleus. So these are, Erythroid precursors, so they will have nucleus. Okay. So erythroid precursors inside the bone marrow. When there is no beta globin chain, this alpha globin chains will tend to accumulate and they will cause membrane damage. And because they are causing membrane damage, these, these precursor RBCs can get destroyed inside the bone marrow through the process of apoptosis. Through the process of apoptosis. I mean, because bone marrow will recognize that this, these uh, erythroblast, these uh, precursor RBCs are abnormal and they are not going to produce normal RBCs. So that is why this bone marrow as a protective mechanism, they will uh, make, they, they will destroy this, these abnormal RBCs which are containing this excessive alpha chains. Okay. And they will just destroy them through the process of apoptosis. And this phenomenon of RBC precursor destruction inside the bone marrow is known as ineffective erythropoiesis. Okay, so I hope you understand this. If the same process, I mean the RBC destruction outside the bone marrow is known as hemolysis, but RBC destruction inside the bone marrow is known as ineffective erythropoiesis. Okay, so IE means ineffective erythropoiesis. And remember, this is the major mechanism in, in the pathogenesis of, of uh, thalassemia. So around 75 to 75 to 80% of RBCs that are produced, they will get destroyed by this process of ineffective erythropoiesis. Okay. But that 25 to 30 percent of RBCs that escape this ineffective erythropoiesis, they can come into the circulation. They can come into the circulation. In the, in the circulation, again, they will also have this alpha inclusions. This alpha inclusions will be perceived as abnormal inside the spleen, and they can cause extravascular hemolysis. Okay, and also, what is the consequences of this? All these RBCs will have reduced hemoglobin. Okay, so they do not have. Uh, they do not have enough hemoglobin because there is no beta gene, there is no normal hemoglobin. Whatever they have is just alpha inclusions and those are not uh, functionally, they are, uh, I mean, they are non-functional. So this reduced, reduced hemoglobin will cause decreased oxygen delivery to the tissues. Okay. So because of decreased oxygen delivery to the tissues, there will be, these patients will be cachectic. These patients will be cachectic. So now all these phenomenon, all this intra ineffective erythropoiesis, this extravascular hemolysis, this decreased oxygen delivery to the tissues. Now all these phenomenon will cause, uh, will increase the production of erythropoietin because now body needs hemoglobin. So there will be increased erythropoietin which will go and cause excessive, which will go. Now all these phenomenon, I would 
so like this all of them will actually cause increased production of erythropoietin and they will actually they will actually stimulate the process of erythropoiesis so there is excessive erythropoiesis okay so this erythropoiesis will increase the process of erythropoiesis will increase so that means there is increased there is increased rbc precursor if you see in the bone marrow of patients with thalassemia like any other hemolytic anemia you will see increased erythroid precursors now there are two consequences and I, as i have told previously this extramedullary uh, hematopoiesis this i am not going to discuss again because i have already discussed multiple times whenever there is increased hemolysis whenever the bone marrow is not able to produce enough rbcs to meet the demands there will be extramedullary hematopoiesis all these things we have already discussed we will have hepatosplenomegaly we will have this chickman faces we got bone so i will not discuss that again but what is important to discuss here is this developing erythroblast this developing erythroblast they will produce a substance a very important substance very important protein that is known as erythroferon they will produce this erythroferon okay so i want all of you to remember this erythroferon okay so what is the function of this erythroferon the function of erythroferon is to inhibit production of hepcidin from the liver so erythroferon from the developing erythroblast it will go to the liver it will inhibit the production of hepcidin now hepcidin is molecule that is being produced inside the liver okay we will discuss more on hepcidin when we will discuss about the iron deficiency anemia and when we will discuss about the hemochromatosis especially the hereditary hemochromatosis okay so hepcidin is a molecule which is produced by liver and what is the function of hepcidin hepcidin is going to uh, hepcidin is actually a negative regulator of iron so if the body has enough iron hepcidin will be activated and that will cause decreased iron absorption from the duodenum as you can see duodenum is the site from where the iron is getting absorbed and uh, inside the duodenum we have this duodenal epithelial cells and the basolateral side of duodenal epithelial cells they will have this ferroportin ferroportin is causing the iron to come from the duodenal epithelial cells into the blood stream similarly we have this macrophage this is actually macrophage we have discussed previously that uh, all these rbcs are destroyed in cases of extravascular hemolysis and also in some um, some cases of intravascular hemolysis whenever this rbcs are destroyed uh, they are usually destroyed in the macrophages okay so in in the extravascular hemolysis the splenic macrophages um, predominantly the splenic macrophages will uh, metabolize or will destroy these rbcs and in uh, in cases of intravascular hemolysis this hemoglobin haptoglobin complex will be recognized by the macrophages and they will cause uh, damage to the rbcs they will phagocytose the rbcs and then they will cause the destruction and in this this process they can actually store the iron molecules as you know uh, when the rbc is getting destroyed it will uh, release the hemoglobin and hemoglobin will be released to, it will be divided into heme and globin but globin will go to the blood because those are amino acids heme component uh, will be again separated into iron and the and the protoporphyrin ring protoporphyrin will be uh, go into the bilirubin pathway and the iron will get deposited in the macrophages now whenever uh, there is a requirement this macrophages can also provide iron to the blood stream and th this is also happened because they also have this ferroportin in their surface and this through this ferroportin this iron can come to the circulation we'll discuss these things again when we we'll discuss about the iron metabolism okay so basically what hepcidin is doing hepcidin, normal function of hepcidin is to inhibit this ferroportin so that the iron content i mean the iron inside the body will stay low okay i mean the iron in the blood stream will stay low so that is the function of hepcidin what erythroferon is doing erythroferon is actually inhibiting this process Erythroferon is inhibiting this process. Now, this is true for any, I mean, any type of hemolytic, hemolytic anemia. This is actually a kind of protective mechanism. So, whenever there is increased erythropoiesis, that means we you need more iron. We need more iron. Okay, and uh, that is why uh, this erythroferon is generated, which will inhibit the hepcidin, so that there will be more and more iron absorption and more and more iron release from the macrophages to the bloodstream, so that this iron can go into the developing erythroblast and they will produce the they can produce the hemoglobin. So that is uh, actually a protective mechanism. It's actually a protective mechanism uh, that happens normally. But what happens in these patients, there is excessive production of erythropoiesis, I mean, excessive uh, production of erythroferon, which will completely suppress the hepcidin and there will be increased iron absorption. There will be increased and increased iron absorption. The problem with uh, thalassemia is not with iron. They have enough iron already. But the problem is with the globin part they have enough heme the problem is with globin part so this excessive iron absorption will lead to a state of excessive iron accumulation excessive iron storage and accumulation 
and also these patients are usually this beta thalassemia usually the major beta thalassemia major patient because they are anemic we have to give this patient transfusion and this transfusion will also contain some iron so this iron pool also will increase with blood transfusion it will also increase with blood transfusion so these patients are also also increased risk of this iron accumulation which is known as a hemochromatosis and this condition is known as secondary hemochromatosis we will discuss about the primary hemochromatosis or genetic hemochromatosis when we will discuss about the chapter of hemochromatosis in the liver pathology section but this is a condition which will cause secondary hemochromatosis secondary hemochromatosis is seen in all the conditions where you are giving excessive iron from the outside most most likely it is due to the blood transfusion in chronic anemia cases okay so these patients will have ineffective erythropoiesis they will have hemolysis extravascular hemolysis they will have extra medullary hematopoiesis they will have this increased iron overload and we have understood all the mechanisms so this is what happens normally okay and and you have already you have also realized that even if there is excessive erythropoiesis even if there is excessive erythropoiesis it is not going to be enough because most of those most of those developing rbcs are getting destroyed inside the bone marrow itself okay so whatever may be the amount of erythropoiesis they are not going to be sufficient for as per the demands of the body okay so definitely they will have persistent anemia and we have to support these patients with blood transfusion okay so i think it's a very i mean somewhat complicated uh pathogenesis but i have tried to make it as simple as possible okay so now that you have understood this now we'll see the further clinical syndromes i mean types of beta thalassemias that we can get now again i told you this is autosomal this is condition so if if both i mean if only one uh, one allele is affected if one allele is affected for example uh, one allele is uh, affected and it is uh, producing no beta globin gene which is denoted by beta 0 and the other allele is absolutely normal and it is producing some amount of beta so this is i mean this is this will be minor again you can you can see this is also heterozygous condition in which one allele is absolutely normal and other allele is also producing some amount of beta globin gene i mean beta globin protein so in these conditions where one allele is absolutely normal they will produce a condition that is known as beta thalassemia minor beta thal minor or trait beta thal minor or beta thal trait or you can say carrier now these patients are i mean they they are asymptomatic they they will not have any problems they will have problems when they get married to another person who is also a beta thalassemia trait as you all must have studied in the chapter genetics if father and mother both are carriers both are traits they can cause a baby with i mean baby homozygous condition that will be very i mean distressing okay again we'll discuss that uh, beta thalassemia trait in another slide but uh, for the timing you remember if one allele is normal absolutely they'll uh, produce this minor or trait so this is a good condition i mean even uh, i am also having this beta thalassemia minor then if both the alleles are severely affected i mean if, if both are beta zero that means no beta globin chain is produced so this is the, the most severe condition that is known as the beta thalassemia major beta thal major this is the most severe condition okay now there are some intermediate conditions like both the alleles are affected but if both are beta plus that means both are producing some amount of globin or only one allele is producing some uh, one allele is producing globin but it is producing somewhat good amount of globin so this is somewhat intermediate between the beta thalassemia trait and the beta thalassemia major so this is known as beta thal intermediate beta thal intermediate Inter intermediate okay so we have three types of situation now beta thalassemia minor or trait major and intermediate the minor is completely asymptomatic no issues major these are definitely dependent on blood transfusion without that they are going to die uh, i mean they, they will die so this is no these are known as the uh, transfusion dependent thalassemias so beta thalassemia major is usually transfusion dependent thalassemias beta thalassemia intermediate they require transfusions i mean intermittently sometimes whenever there is stress or maybe some in some situations they require thalassemia but for their survival they are not dependent on transfusion so these are known as non transfusion dependent thalassemias okay so clinically we see whether it is a transfusion dependent thalassemia or non transfusion dependent thalassemia 
usually in our current practice, we don't uh, uh, prefer this uh, using the term uh, beta thalassemia major and beta thalassemia intermediate. We prefer the term transfusion dependent thalassemia, non transfusion dependent thalassemia. Why? Because some of the beta thalassemia intermediate patients can also behave like non transfusion dependent thalassemia. Some of them can behave like transfusion dependent thalassemia. Now we'll see what happens whenever there is, if this beta thal intermediate patients also have alpha thalassemia, they also have alpha thalassemia. Now you might be thinking that if the patient is having two thalassemias, both beta and alpha thalassemia, that means they will produce a severe condition. No, but if you have understood the pathogenesis, what is the major problem here? Why the RBCs are getting destroyed? Most of the RBCs, developing RBCs are getting destroyed in the process of ineffective erythropoiesis. And ineffective erythropoiesis is because of excessive unpaired alpha accumulation. Excessive unpaired alpha accumulation. So if the patient has concomitant alpha thalassemia, this amount of alpha globin will, will be reduced. Okay, so there will be less severe membrane damage and there will be less ineffective erythropoiesis. So actually, if the patient with beta thalassemia intermediate or if the patient with beta thalassemia have concomitant alpha thalassemia, the severity will reduce. Okay, so they will have re reduced severity. And this is a very, very beautiful concept. And, and uh, this you can understand only if you have understood the pathophysiology. Okay. But at the same time, if they have alpha duplication, I mean, if they have excessive alpha, glo alpha globin production, this intermediate can behave like a major. I mean, there will be excessive alpha accumulation and that will cause more ineffective erythropoiesis and they can actually behave like major and so they can behave like a transfusion dependent thalassemia. So I, I just gave one example how this beta thalassemia intermediate can behave like a transfusion dependent thalassemia, but there can be other, I mean, other causes also in which these patients can behave like TDT. Okay, so these are the various types of clinical syndromes that are possible. So minor intermediate trait, minor, uh, I mean, sorry, minor intermediate major, minor is nothing, asymptomatic. And uh, major, we have, we will discuss that, uh, that these patients will become completely transfusion dependent and uh, intermediate, it depends on various factors. Sometimes they are non-transfusion dependent, sometimes they are transfusion dependent. Okay, so now we'll say, now we'll discuss about the beta thalassemia major. And what, what are the clinical features? Now, as I have told you, this is the most severe conditions. And usually these patients are symptomatic after six to nine months of age. Why? Why they are symptomatic after six months? Because still six months, we have some amount of gamma, gamma globins. So the patients can still produce alpha gamma, alpha to gamma two, that is hemoglobin F. I mean, the patients can, they, they still have some kind of hemoglobin. But after six months, there is no gamma. And uh, the alpha has to bind with beta. And in beta thalassemia, we don't have beta. We don't have beta. So, so after six months only, they will become symptomatic. Okay. So usually in these patients, the hemoglobin is around three to six gram per deciliter and they are dependent on transfusion. As you can see here, this is the picture I was telling you. This is the chipmunk, the classical chipmunk facet. Chipmunk facet. As you can see here, there is maxillary prominence. There is frontal bossing. I mean, the central part is somewhat depressed and the surrounding part is enlarged. Also, they have this, uh, I mean, it is not shown here, they will have this jaw abnormalities, dental malocclusion. So, all those things are possible. And if you, uh, this also, I have told you previously, this is one of the clear part skull. This is a clear part skull. It's because of excessive erythropoiesis in the skull bones. This is because of the facial bones. So, this is the classical chipmunk facial. So, from the distance itself, you can tell that this patient might be having some kind of hemolytic anemia. It's not specific to any particular disease. It is seen in all the hemolytic animals where there is excessive hematopoiesis. Okay, now, okay, so uh, I mean, I, I need to tell here that this phenomenon is predominant if the, I mean, the hemolytic process is predominant from the childhood. Okay, all the childhood hemolytic animals will have this because till then, uh, I mean, uh, the bones are not completely developed. In adults, if you have some hemolytic anemia, they will not produce this kind of facy. This is for the, I mean, the inherited, most of the inherited hemolytic animals. Also, they will have splenomegaly. This also I have discussed because they will have extravascular hemolysis. And this splenomegaly can be because of both extravascular hemolysis and because of extra medullary hematopoiesis, both. And also, they will have secondary hemat hemochromatosis. This we will discuss more when we will discuss about the liver pathology. What are the features we are going to get in secondary hemochromatosis? Okay. So, Again, for us, most important thing is what we are going to get in peripheral smear. So peripheral smear, the, the, the basic defect is the hemoglobin content is less. 
so they will cause microcytic hypochromic anemia so rbcs are microcytic and hypochromic so how do you identify a, uh, a hypochromic rbc so hypochromic rbcs uh, will have i mean chrome, chrome i mean uh, the because of the hemoglobin content is less the central pallor will be increased normally the central pallor will contain the one third of the entire rbc this we have discussed previously so if you see if you look at this rbc this is actually somewhat normal rbc because the central pallor is only around one third but if you see this rbc you can see definitely there is a difference the, the central pallor is increased so that is known as the hypochromia so this patient will have microcytic hypochromic rbcs then they will also have anisopoiprocytosis that means variation in size and uh, shape and size okay so this is also seen in these patients and because of excessive erythropoiesis you are, you are also going to get this nrbcs because this precursor form may sometimes come into the blood and uh, you can also find this basophilic stippling we have discussed previously basophilic stippling we have discussed when we discuss about the pyruvate sorry the pyrimidine 5 prime nucleotidase deficiency and at that time also i have told you any cases of ineffective erythropoiesis any cases of ineffective erythropoiesis can produce this kind of basophilic stippling so that is also we are going to get and also we'll get target cells as we have discussed in sickle cell disease in sickle cell it is because of the it is because of the dehydration but in thalassemia it is probably because of increased membrane content rather than the dehydration so that also can produce some target cells okay so these are all the findings various findings that we are going to get what will happen to the reticulocyte count now retic count will be increased definitely because there is ongoing hemolysis the erythropoiesis is increased so retic count will, will increase but this retic count increase in retic count is not proportionate to the degree of hemolysis why because most of the developing erythroblasts are getting destroyed inside the bone marrow itself through the process of ineffective erythropoiesis okay so that is why the <clears throat> that is why the retic count will be will be increased but it is not proportionate to the degree of hemolysis so that is what you need to understand okay so after this we'll just okay we'll just see the, the i mean the, the confirmatory diagnosis with, with hplc if you do hplc what you're going to get is whatever hemoglobin we are getting it is only hemoglobin f so any condition i mean if the patient is dependent on transfusions and if you're getting a picture like this if you are getting a picture like this, the answer has to be it is a homozygous alpha, uh, homozygous beta thalassemia. So we, we give the report as homozygous beta thalassemia. I mean, if, if the patient doesn't have beta globin, whatever, uh, I mean, whatever uh, gamma globins they have, this alpha will go and bind to them, and they'll the only type of hemoglobin that we are going to get is hemoglobin F. Okay, so uh, what is going to the clinical course? They die early. If if you are not treating the patient, they will die early. If you give them regular blood transfusion and along with that you are giving iron chelation, iron chelation is for hemochromatosis, they may survive up to second to third decade. And beyond that, survival is difficult without any, uh, any uh, well, I mean, definitive treatment. Definitive treatments include hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and uh, gene therapy. Uh, gene therapy is still, I mean, it's still an upcoming thing not widely available uh, stem cell transplantation, transplantation definitely we do uh, for the patients okay so this is what uh, is about the beta thalassemia major now we'll see the beta thalassemia minor now this is a condition i told you usually these patients are asymptomatic usually these patients are asymptomatic and how they will come into the clinical picture now this is how i came into the picture that i also have beta thalassemia minor this is, this is actually cbc parameter of uh, my cbc parameter when i I was suffering from fever and I got my CBC done. I get a picture like this. Now, if you see here, hemoglobin is absolutely normal. It's a very good amount of hemoglobin. According to WHO, what is the definition for anemia? It is less than 13 for males. So if you see here, hemoglobin is around 14.7, which is very good for me. If you see TLC, it's normal. Platelet count is normal. So I'm happy that everything is normal. But what you can see here, MCV. See, the MCV is severely reduced. It is 63. It is 63 MCV is severely reduced. Now, if a patient is having low MCV, the first thing that should come to your mind is iron deficiency anemia. That is the first thing should become. That is the most common cause for microcytic hypochromic anemia. Overall, iron deficiency anemia is the most common, I mean, most common cause of anemia. So that is the first thing it should come to your mind. But what is the next step we have to see? 
whenever you find low such low mcb you see the rbc count see the rbc count now normally rbc count we have discussed previously that rbc count is around 5 billion per microliter it's around 5 billion but if you see here it is again severely increased it is around 7.5 million per microliter rbc count is severely increased now in this beta thalassemia manner what is going to happen there will be slight reduction in the hemoglobin production so if you see the peripheral smear you will get microcytosis definitely you will get microcytic hypochromic picture microcytic hypochromic picture but the uh, the amount of uh, ineffective erythropoiesis is very less in these patients i mean it will be there it will be there but it will be significantly less compared to the patients with beta thalassemia major okay so that is why uh, that is why whenever there is increased erythropoiesis in these patients because they have this uh, reduced hemoglobin production also there will be increased erythropoiesis and this increased erythropoiesis will cause increase in rbc production they will cause increase rbc production okay so i hope it is clear they produce rbcs which are microcytic hypochromic they will have some amount of ineffective erythropoiesis which is very less compared to beta thalassemia major but this some amount of ineffective erythropoiesis can actually stimulate the production of stimulate the process of erythropoiesis and this stimulation will cause increase in rbc count though all these rbcs will have reduced content of hemoglobin but the count rbc count will increase so that is what will happen in this beta thalassemia minor so that is why we are getting this increased rbc count so that is how this usually these patients come into attention because of this if you if they uh, do the cbc and if you if you are a good physician you you know the concepts we are seeing the cbc most of the times what we see is hemoglobin tlc perplated everything is normal we don't do anything but if you see carefully the mcb is reduced and normal mcb is around 80 to 100 is significantly reduced then you see the rbc which is significantly increased okay so this condition you have to suspect beta thalassemia minor so from this uh, understanding they have they have derived an index that is known as menzer index there is no need to i mean mug up this uh, formula this is actually mcb divided by rbc mcb divided by rbc the formula is mcb by rbc what happens in beta thalassemia minor the rbc will increase so definitely the ratio will decrease okay this index is to differentiate between iron deficiency anemia and beta thalassemia minor iron deficiency anemia and beta thalassemia minor okay so this this is to differentiate these two we will discuss about iron deficiency anemia in iron deficiency anemia there there, there will be no ineffective erythropoiesis so there will be no excessive erythropoietic erythropoietic stimulation so erythropoiesis is happens at a slower rate in iron deficiency anemia so the rbc count will be less in iron deficiency anemia but in beta thalassemia minor the rbc count will increase mcb will be reduced in both cases and rbc count will increase in beta thalassemia minor because rbc count is increased the ratio of mcb to rbc will be reduced for beta thalassemia minor so that is why the ratio is uh, the, the, the ratio that is taken is 13 so if it is less than 13 it is beta thalassemia minor if it is more than 13 it is iron deficiency anemia again this is not always true but for the purpose of i mean theoretical study just remember this point less than 13 13 it should be less than 13 to call it as thalassemia minor and in this case it is severely reduced but then i got my hplc done and i found that i am having beta thalassemia minor okay so anyway so in uh, so these patients beta thalassemia minor they will not have any symptoms any complications the only thing is there two important issues that we have to study regarding this one is these are easily confused with iron deficiency anemia easily confused with iron deficiency anemia i mean not always this menzer index will help you to differentiate sometimes you will get a borderline value sometimes you will get a completely false value so sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between iron deficiency and thalassemia so we have to evaluate for iron deficiency anemia and if there is iron deficiency we have to treat this patients the second uh, most important point is about the family counseling i mean this persons this patients i mean this the persons who are having this beta thalassemia minor ideally they should not get married to a person who is also having this kind of beta thalassemia trait okay ideally they should not marry because there is always a chance 25% chance that their child will have this child will have the major disease okay but with now with current uh, understanding and the developments uh even if uh, both for mother and father uh both are carriers we can have some kind of uh, you know prenatal testings to see whether the child is having whether the fetus is having uh, a homozygous state or not and and uh, subsequently we can take the decision based on that whether to continue pregnancy or not you know those things i am not going to discuss here so that is these are the two issues that we have to see for these patients so okay so first is differentiate for iron deficiency if it is there you treat them 
Second thing is family counseling. Peripherals mayor, you are going to get this microcytic hypochromic RBCs. You will also get some target cells and sometimes basophilic stippling. Okay. Otherwise, the patient will be completely asymptomatic. Most of the times, these are incidentally diagnosed. And uh, the, the only important point uh, that we are going to find is increase in hemoglobin A2. So that is the, whenever we suspect beta thalassemia minor or trait and we are doing HPLC, the only thing that we are looking for is hemoglobin A2. If it is something around 4 to 9, HPA2 is around 4 to 9. Normal HPA2, I told you, it is around 2 to 3 percent. And if it is something between 4 to 9, this is definitive uh, diagnosis for this beta thalassemia trait or minor. Okay, so hemoglobin A2 is alpha 2 delta 2, alpha 2 delta 2. So if beta is slightly reduced, the alpha will tend to try, tend to, you know, combine with delta and they will cause this increase delta, increased HPA2. Okay, so that is the pointer for this trait, beta thalassemia trait. Okay, so we have discussed everything about beta thalassemia. Now we'll discuss about the alpha thalassemia. So alpha thalassemia it will be a very short discussion. So uh, I told you in uh, one in beta thalassemia it is mostly the point mutations that are affecting either the splicing process or the chain promoter or the chain terminator. But in alpha thalassemia the, the, the most common uh, type of mutation that you are going to see is the delisional type of mutation. Now we have already discussed previously that uh, alpha thalassemia I mean the alpha uh, gene cluster is present on chromosome chromosome 16 chromosome 16. And alpha gene, uh, actually it, has, it is represented by two genes, HbA2 and HbA1. This also I have told you previously. So each chromosome will have two genes. Okay, so there will be total four genes for alpha uh, alpha globin. There are four genes. And if one one of those genes is deleted, when one gene is deleted, again that is a carrier state. And it is, they will cause only mild microcytosis, microcytosis and they are completely asymptomatic. So nothing, nothing to worry about these patients. What happens whenever there is two Gene deletion, two gene deletion. Now this two gene deletion, gene deletion will cause a, I mean, in this condition, two genes are affected and two genes are normal. So if you have 50% of the normal genes, it will behave like beta thalassemia minor or beta thalassemia, uh, I mean trait. It will behave like beta thalassemia minor. So these are known as alpha thalassemia trait. The first one, one gene deletion is carrier. Two gene deletion is like trait. As we have discussed for beta thalassemia, if one gene is normal, they will become trait. So here also they are, they are they, these are known as alpha thalassemia trait. Also these patients will be mostly most of the times they are asymptomatic. <laughs> then uh, there is one more important very important concept. If both if uh, alpha thalassemia trait is also behaving like I mean they they are it is also like beta thalassemia trait. Then how will you differentiate them? So if you do this HPLC in actually beta thalassemia trait the HB HBA two is in, will be increased in alpha thalassemia trait. It will be normal or reduced. Okay. Anyway, those understandings are, I mean, those things are not important now because it's slightly, I mean, higher concept. So not very important now. What you need to understand is they are traits and they are asymptomatic. But there is a catch here. This two gene deletion can be of trans type, can be of cis type. So trans type means uh, the two alpha genes are deleted. Uh, I mean, one alpha gene is deleted from one chromosome. Cis deletion means the two alpha genes that are deleted, they are from the same chromosome. Now, can you tell me which is a more, I mean, undesirable condition, which, which you don't want? Actually, we don't want the cis type of deletion. We don't want this. Why? Because, why? because if if this uh, patient, if this person is uh, will get married to another female, for example, this is a male and this is having, is having two gene deletion here and other chromosome is normal. Other is normal. What happens when he, she will, he will get married to another female who is having a single gene deletion? Who is having a single gene deletion? Now, if these if these two chromosomes combine, the child will have the picture like this. I mean, the child will have a three gene deletion, three gene deletional condition. So three gene deletion will be symptomatic. This will be symptomatic for alpha thalassemia. Okay. So if, if for example, this is a male. If this male is having a cis type of two gene deletion, he will get married to a carrier female. He will get married to a carrier female who is just having single alpha gene deletion. 
they will produce a child with three they can produce a child with three gene deletion so that is why this cis type of configuration we don't want so that is not desirable in the same case if the if the if the a person would have had a trans type of deletion as you can imagine here if you if you had a trans type of deletion the maximum that it can produce is a two gene deletion it can produce a two gene deletion in the in the child okay so trans type is desirable because in the next generation there is there is not there is no increased risk of thalassemia alpha thalassemia but this, if you have the cis type then there is increased risk of alpha thalassemia in the children and this cis variety is commonly found in asians so that is why in asians you are more likely to get alpha thalassemia okay in asians you are more likely to get alpha thalassemia now what is going to happen whenever there is a three gene deletion that we'll see here now this so that is why asians have increased risk of this three gene deletion and this three gene deletion will cause severe decrease in alpha globin production severe decrease in alpha globin production during the fetal life whatever alpha globin is produced it can bind to the gamma globin and uh, they will produce the hemoglobin f and the fetal life is usually asymptomatic that is normal but what happens whenever you know they, they come uh, in the prenatal life whenever the uh, whenever the beta globin uh, i mean the uh, gamma globin is reduced and the beta globin will start start uh, will start to accumulate this beta globins will not have enough alpha to bind to them so this beta globins will uh, form this beta 4 tetramers this beta 4 tetramer is otherwise known as the hemoglobin h hemoglobin h now this beta 4 tetramer i mean if you compare them with the alpha uh, tetramers if, if you compare the beta 4 tetramers with the alpha tetramers we have discussed previously that alpha tetramers in beta thalassemia they will they are forming these inclusions and uh, they are they are making them uh, they, they are causing severe membrane damage and ineffective erythropoiesis but if you compare this alpha 4 tetramer with the beta 4 tetramers that we are going to get in patients with alpha thalassemia beta 4 tetramers are slightly better compared to alpha tetramers because beta 4 tetramers are slightly more soluble they are slightly more soluble and stable slightly better than alpha 4 tetramers that's, that's why they will not cause ineffective erythropoiesis ineffective erythropoiesis doesn't happen in these patients okay they're slightly soluble and they're stable so they will not cause enough membrane damage to cause ineffective erythropoiesis but but we have also discussed that beta whenever you have beta 4 tetramer or gamma 4 tetramer we'll discuss gamma 4 tetramer in the next but beta 4 tetramer they have very high increased very high oxygen affinity they have increased oxygen affinity so that means they are not going to give oxygen to the tissues so there will be tissue level hypoxia there will be tissue level tissue level hypoxia and the patient will be symptomatic for that okay and also they can have uh, increased risk of extravascular hemolysis because any type of inclusion on the rbcs will be perceived ab abnormal by the screening macrophages so they will have some kind of extravascular hemolysis usually these patients they behave like beta thalassemia intermediate they behave like beta thalassemia intermediate okay so this is about three gene deletion and there is a very important question that they used to ask like uh, how this hbh inclusions can be can be diagnosed i mean how how can you see them it's a very good spotter question so this is actually they will uh, this beta for inclusions or otherwise known as the hbh inclusion hbh inclusion this you can identify on supravital strain supravital strain like the brilliant crystal blue or new methyl blue you can identify this kind of inclusions these are known as the golf ball inclusions. The golf ball inclusions. They're known as the golf ball inclusions. Okay, so this is for HBH or beta 4. Okay, so this is about the three gen deletion. Now we'll see what, what is going to happen when there is a four gen deletion. Four gen deletion means absolutely no alpha globin is produced. Absolutely no alpha globin. So these patients are symptomatic in the fetal life itself intrauterine they will be symptomatic because there are no alpha globins and for hemoglobin f you need alpha globin you need alpha globin and in this condition there is no alpha globin so now the hemoglobin tetramer will contain only gamma globin so this is known as the gamma 4 they will form this gamma 4 inclusions these gamma 4s are actually these are known as hemoglobin bart hemoglobin bart this is also compared to alpha alpha tetramer slightly soluble and stable but they have a, again they have a very severe they have very increased high very high oxygen affinity very 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 high oxygen affinity i mean much more than the hemoglobin f so because of this high oxygen affinity they will not give any oxygen to the tissues they will this hemoglobin will 
hold up all the oxygen with themselves. They will not give oxygen to the tissues. So intrauterine, the patient, the the, 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 you know, the child, the fetus will develop, I mean, tissue level hypoxia and ultimately they will develop congestive cardiac failure. And this because of this congestive cardiac failure, they will have severe edema. And those that, that is why these are known as hydrops. So that is why the name hydrops fetalis. Okay, so they will cause hydrops fetalis because of the severe edema and severe blown up. And most of the times, the, the, this, uh, I mean, these fetus, they die in dry uterine life. Of late, now we have some measures, some, I mean, you can say this, these are heroic measures. You can go for intrauterine tran uh, transfusions. You can go for intrauterine stem cell transplants. And of course, uh, it is, I mean, it's not widely available, but these are some of the heroic measures we have to take if you want to, if you want to, you know, keep this uh, fetus alive. Otherwise, most of the times they will die in the intrauterine life. Okay, so that is all about the alpha thalassemias. So this is a very extensive discussion of alpha thalassemias, I mean, thalassemias but uh, now I hope I have cleared all your concepts. So thank you for listening. If any doubts, you can always ask me.